here today with you. Um, this has been quite a journey, and that sweet lady that just was on the stage has been a big part of it. She has been my mentor, my, um, my editor-in-chief, my guide, um, to give me softer words and to help God's heart be seen and heard through this study. So I'm very thankful for her and for others that have helped as well. Um, this has been a six-year now journey for me uh, because I didn't respond right away. As often we don't because we don't think we're qualified. We don't think we're good enough. We don't think that God can use us in certain ways that he's never used us before. But um, he's shown me that that's not really true. That all we have to do is be obedient. And, and, and he'll provide everything else for us. So as we get into this study, I just want you to know that this is something that God has taught me. It's something my heart needed to know. It's something that I needed some change in my life over and uh, to rethink this whole idea and concept about time because I wasn't treating it the way God needed it to be treated. And so he has given to me some insights that have begun a journey for me to transform and change the way that I spend my time. So with that, here we go. Um, I just want you to think in the course of the day, one day, maybe today, uh, how often do you refer to time? Do you look at a calendar? Do you look at your watch? Do you look at your iPhone? To refer to maybe what time it is, what time you need to be somewhere, if the store's going to open or close at a certain time, when you're telling your children you've got five minutes before the bus comes. Or you say, just give me one more minute. One more minute. I mean, think about all the ways that we refer to time in a day. I would say often. And sometimes I might even say that time might actually possess our day. The thought of it. Thinking about it. Focusing on it. And so if it is that important and we truly do use it that often in referral and, and thinking about it, shouldn't we try to figure out what its purpose is and why God might want us to use it for his glory, his, his way, his use? Um, so I have this friend that um, uh, I love her to death, and I am very envious, I guess you could say, of just her ability to decorate. I go into her home and in these little spaces, she, you can tell that she has just taken such great care and made these meticulous decisions about every little piece, the color, the placement, what, what is going to be in those spaces in her home. And she goes out, I know, because of what I see as a result, she is thinking about that space as she is preparing that space. So she creates it with that space in mind. And you know, I think that God is the same way. He has created for us, designed for us creation, and he has made every meticulous decision with that creation in mind. And that includes time. He has meticulously thought about time to remind us that he is the creator of it. And we can see that even in his, uh, in his word, where we see in Genesis 1-1, from the very beginning, God goes on to say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then over the next few um, verses, talks about him speaking light into being. It talks about him telling that the light was good and he separates it from darkness to let us know that he didn't say darkness was good even though he created it and it was here, it has a purpose as well. But then he goes on and in verse five, he says, uh, then God, God called the, the light day. So he names it and he calls the darkness night. And that is the first day. So he establishes our day in the very beginning. So it leads us to understand or to think, why? Why did God create time? Why would he do that? What's its purpose? Because he doesn't need it. He's not constrained by it. It's not something that he's requiring. So it leads us then to think, 
that God created time with us in mind. And therefore, we need to think about it. We need to think and try to understand what is God's purpose for time. Well, originally, if we go back and we look at the very beginning, you know, because all things, I want you to keep this in mind, all things were created with his creation in mind. Not necessarily for us, but with us in mind, okay? And so, you know, his original intention for mankind and for our relationship with him was that we would love God, we would serve God, we would honor God, we would glorify God, and we would have fellowship with him. That was in the original idea, thought. I don't think that thought has changed. Some other things have changed, but I don't think that thought has changed. I believe God still, his intention with our time is for us to love him, serve him, bring glory to him, honor him, have fellowship with him. And there's evidence for that in things that we see. See, in Genesis 1, 14 through 15, God goes on to tell us a little bit more about this concept and this idea of time. Because he creates the lights in the vault of the sky, and then he separates day from night, yes. But then he goes on to tell us why. What's the purpose for them originally? Well, originally it says, let them serve the lights and the vaults in the sky and all the things as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. So he is telling us in that. Yes, then he goes on to create two, two lights for us, the moon and the, and, and the sun, obviously, so we would never be in darkness. I think that's the purpose of that. We'd always have a light to remind us of him. But as he establishes in Genesis about this idea of um, sacred times, marking them, why do you think he, he had to create that in his, dis, in his um, design? Well, probably because we weren't going to think about it on our own. And then we see, if you've been reading through the Bible Project, as we have here at church, you know in Exodus, he goes on to establish, his, to establish certain celebrations that he required Israelites to have. And those celebrations, just three of them, from Exodus 23, 14 through 19, he establishes some feasts. Well, first was the unleavened bread or the Passover feast, which is referred to as Pesach in Hebrew. It was the time for them to celebrate the goodness of God bringing them out of Egypt and to remind them of that and that they would do it year after year. And then he goes on and he talks about the harvest feast where in Hebrew it is referred to as Shabbat. So this was the time for God, for people to remember that God has provided the seeds for the planting of the, of the seasons, for, for their food, and for them to celebrate God in his goodness for providing that. And then he goes on, and the next celebration is of tabernacles, which is the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew word sakath, which is then... They've planted, now they're going to gather, they're going to bring in, they're going to reap the benefits that God has provided for them with the fruit of their work from the field. But again, to celebrate that the goodness of God, that was what it was originally due. And then in that same scripture, it says it was to serve to mark the days and years for us to recognize the faithfulness of God. In every sunrise, every sunset, every year, every season. That's what it originally was meant to do, right? However, we know some more of the story happened and that disobedience is on the horizon. See, we see even in Genesis 2.17 that God, are, he warns Adam and Eve ahead of time and he tells them, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die, certainly die. See, he already, <laughs> he knows we're going to do it. But I guess my question is, sometimes I wonder, why did Adam and Eve disobey? Why did they not believe God? And then I remember, well, same reason Libby doesn't. Because <laughs> I choose not to, right? He gave us choice and free will. Because he wanted a relationship with us that was not forced, that we had an option in. Because that's the best kind of relationship, not the one that's demanded, but the one that is willingly given. And so he wanted that for us too. 
So then in Genesis 3, 6, we see Eve took of some of the fruit and she ate it. And then she gave it to her husband and he ate it too. And then from that moment, it is that moment that things began to change. Um, we see now the once easy um, relationship and ability to get food and all of those things are no longer going to be that way. Because in Genesis 3.19, God says, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food and in, until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you will return. See, for the first time, mankind has to face its mortality. For the first time, death entered into the world. Our relationship with God has now changed. The very idea of humanity's existence has changed, and the concept of time also has changed. It went from eternal to temporal. It's going to be limited now. And see, God knew as soon as we had limited resource of time, we would begin to trip further and further and further from him with its purpose and its use as well. See, in that, that idea, that view of time, when it becomes ours, that means I have this mine principle. It's mine, 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 mine. And I get to do it in self-serving ways. I get to use it in what matters to me, not no longer what it matters to God necessarily. You know, we get into this scarcity idea, this scarcity. It's, there's, there's just so much of it, and I need it. So I'm going to try to covet it. I'm going to control it. I'm going to desire it. I'm going to manipulate it. I'm going to do all the things that sin brought into the world and twisted the idea of the original way that the relationship was supposed to be. See, I want you to think about time. Before, um, before sin entered the world uh, as this massive uh, sandy beach that just goes on and on forever. You know, we didn't think it, we wouldn't think about one single grain in that moment because there's millions and millions and millions and millions. But as soon as sin entered our world and it became limited, and this is all we have. Our existence, and we may not even get all of the sand because none of us know when our time on this earth is going to be over. None of us. It's established, but we don't know when that's going to be. And so if this is all we have now, I want you to think, as we pass through here in the next two minutes, you have time that is gone that you'll never get back. Right? And so we begin to then, and if you don't believe this scarcity concept exists, you didn't live in 2020. And the, <laughs> and the toilet paper hoarding that went on <laughs> and various other things. Or you've never been a parent that has stood in line or been po poised by a computer with your finger at midnight to get just that toy, just that computer game, because heaven forbid, there's probably only 10 of them. Right? Or you've never been in line on a Black Friday, like I'm guilty, I have, and been there four hours before the store ever opened because the advertisement said the special price and oh my goodness, I got to have one of those and not everybody's going to get one. You know, that idea of scarcity. So that same principle goes to our schedules, ladies. I want you, and I'm, I'm, I'm pointing fingers at myself, God pointed fingers at me. So don't think you're the only ones that I might be pointing fingers at or that God might be pointing fingers out. But if your schedule is such that it is so full that you don't have room for one more, but you're going to squeeze one more thing in there. Or if your planning involves just things that matter to you, the fact that it's just your family, your time, your life, as he showed me, then we've kind of twisted this idea of what time is supposed to be. See, this attitude of self-reliance, God knew. He would take us from, you know, I don't even need God. I mean, if you're not going to be the commander of my time, why are you going to be the commander of anything for me? Two, I don't need you to, I don't even believe in you. 
And there's where humanity is gone and it continues to go. You know, this self-reliance created for us a way for us to manipulate time, for us to manage, for us to define it. You know, we began to develop inventions. We think we're so smart as a human being and so creative that we got to make oil lamps and sundials and hourglasses and uh, sand glasses and all kinds of clocks from water to uh, candle to mechanical to atomic to you name it, right? Oh, we're so smart. But here's the, the wonderful thing is that God, our creator, has loved us so much. He continues to pursue us. He continues to try to teach us and bring us back to him, back to the original purpose of time, to help us to understand that time is a gift and that we are to think about the way we are to use it for his glory and his purpose. See, God definitely wants us to recognize that. And how do we know that? Well, we know it because there's definitely evidence for it. Again, if I get my page turned. Okay. In this idea of um, creation, in the design of creation, we can see it everywhere. We can see the purpose for time in the way that things work, in the way that they're supposed to work. You know, from the cycle of life, just life in itself, from animals, human beings, seasons that we see that continually come around. God has embedded in the very creation that he has this idea of life, yes, after death. Life after death. I was reminded of that uh, just yesterday morning as I got up and I went out to put my bird feeders and, and there in my flower beds were the beautiful little crocuses and daffodils. And I'm thinking, oh, don't come up yet. Don't come up yet. It's too early. But the thing that I don't think about, I just have always just appreciated the flower, but I've never really thought about how God had, had put in the, our design the sun that has been working all winter on that ground to prepare the seed so that the seedling can come up. And we get to see the flowers. See, he'd been working a long time before we actually see the beauty of the plant itself. And so, ladies, I just propose to you that you allow God to begin to work in you through the sun, S-O-N, that he begins to teach us about this idea of time. And just like that little flower, it may take a while to work and to help us to change our view and our idea of what time is before the world ever gets to see how we change our schedules and our time out there. But allow him to work in you anyway. So God put it in creation. We know that. God also wrote it down because he knew we'd need more than just the obvious from creation. We'd need more than that. And so he wrote it in his word, and we begin to see it all the way from Genesis 1-1, as we said in the beginning, God created, and then you can go from there. But all the way, you know, in, in Scripture, just the word time and times is written almost a thousand different entries. That's not counting day, evening, morning, in the year of, eternity. So if God puts that many, that much, ener that much energy in putting these ideas about time in his word, doesn't it make sense that it should matter and that we should worry about it and think about it and actually figure out how he wants us to, to utilize it? And we're going to do this over this study because I have found many scriptures that God has blatantly slammed in my face to say, see, this is what I need you to do. This is what I need you to do. And for me, that's the way God often speaks, is up, up in my face. But I will tell you, for this study, he didn't, speak. It was like Elijah. He whispered because that really got my attention finally. And so anyway, um, so God wrote in his word and all the way to Revelation 21, 12 through 13, where it says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. See, God established the beginning and he definitely has established the end, but time for us is in the middle. And that's where we get to choose. That's where we have choices about what we do with it. And God says it matters. It matters. 
In Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, this is scripture here that many of us have probably seen before where uh, King Solomon is talking and reflecting about his life. Uh, and he says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And then he goes on and he talks about you know, 14 different pairs of beginnings and ends. Things like a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. So we have that beginning and that end. We see that, that things are going to be in this rhythm of over and over again, of things beginning, things ending, a time for them to start, a time for them to happen, and then a time for them to be over. So, uh, you know, God just tells us that there's going to be positive and negative things in our life as well. That those things are going to ebb and flow throughout our life. And that while there, there are going to be rich blessings, yes, but there are also going to be hardships. And, you know, the scripture is filled with people that have experienced both in their lifetime. You know, we've studied many people like Joseph and Job and David and Ruth and the disciples. And while Libby's name is not written in that Bible... I certainly have experienced the hardship and the blessing. And then I'd like for you to put your name in that blank, right? Because if you are in a season of good, wonderful. Relish it. Enjoy it. Take it in. Because the next season's coming. If you are in a season of hardship right now, ladies, know it's not going to last forever. That good is on the horizon. A better time is coming. And God promises that and he shows us that. And Solomon, with all that he had, reflected over that. Um, and he understands that as well. And that we know we're not alone in this. Others have experienced it as well. You know, we can learn from both the positive and negative things in life. We can see and learn lessons. You know, God sometimes wants us to understand that in the positive places or even in the negative places, those lessons that we learn. I know for myself, um, you know, the laughter and joy has truly come sweetest just after that moment of bitter sorrow and weeping. That the moments of peace that I have felt that have been the deepest and the most relaxing have come after a long, really hard, hard battle has been fought. But here's what I know. God is faithful no matter the circumstance. He's always there. And our attitude about those circumstances, they are important for us to understand and to know they matter, whether it's positive or negative seasons of life. See, we can stay focused in the hardship. We can stay there. Satan would love for us to stay there and feel sorry for ourselves and to also just hold on to the pain and the bitterness. But we can do that so much that we miss the blessing of God's grace and mercy in both of them, the good and the bad. See, sometimes we need to be looking for the transformations in our hearts that are needed in those times, both good and bad. Because even in the good, how often do we stop and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for whatever it is, you know, for the things I have, for the things I'm able to do, the people that I share my life with. For where I have a body of believers, I get to go and freely worship. I'm thankful for those things. You know, maybe it's though a transformation that has to happen because I need to let go of some people and some things in my life that are not healthy and they certainly do not honor God. And maybe there are things that God has not called me to be in. And I need to let them go. Because he needs me to learn. Or maybe he needs me somewhere else to do something else. No matter the, the situation, we can learn from them. I was watching a, an interview with Rick Warren that dealt with the suicide of his son, Matthew. And he was talking about um, the fact that he, would, he and his wife, Kay, would never have have chosen the ministry that God is now using them for, to be able to minister to people who are um, involved in, in family members or whoever that uh, have committed suicide. You know, the, the replications of that and the things that are left behind and the hurts and things that go. And he said, I've talked, he's talked to all kinds of people from all over the world, from all walks of life, some very famous. He said, it wouldn't be something I chose, but God has put me there 
And one thing he said is we don't we do not waste even one negative experience. We allow God to use it. So he also said, not everything is going to be healed on this earth. Something he came to realize. And ladies, this is a time when he spent 16 weeks not preaching, just alone with he and God. And it's also the time when he wrote Purpose Driven Life. Because he realized, you know, God could use this. And think about all the people that have been blessed by that book and his testimony, right? He said, our greatest ministry comes out of the deepest, our deepest pain. Our greatest witness to the world is how we handle pain. So the thing we need to remember is we need to surrender our will in both the good and the bad. We need to acknowledge that God's presence is there in both. His protection, his provision, his promises are in all circumstances. Yes, there is a time for every matter. But who will we cling to, give praise to, honor in all those times? See, God is present in both. His power is accessible in both. His comfort is possible in both. And his blessing is abundant in both. But will we be able to see and trust him in every season? See, God was there before your circumstance. God is there in the middle of your circumstance. And God will be there after that circumstance. See, time is something I hope that you will understand that God created for us. It is limited. The seasons we experience within our life will come and go. But we get to choose our attitudes about those seasons. We get to figure out what we're going to learn from them, who we'll cling to through them, and all of it matters. So ladies, I'm going to each week, I will put a challenge before you for the week. And so your challenge this week is that you will deeply consider our God as creator and that time was made with us in mind. That we will begin to look and see God's blessing in every circumstance that you face this week. That we'll remember that this season is temporary. So if you're in a good season, prepare for the next. If you're in a hard season, just know hope is on the horizon. I challenge you to look at the ways um, to use your time specifically this week in ways that you can make a difference for others and for God's kingdom. That we will have an attitude of gratitude this week. I really look forward to hearing what God is going to do and what he's going to say. And as you go into your week of study um, uh, on this first session, every week I'm going to write out a prayer for you because I want to pray over you, uh, pray over us, because God is still, I don't have this time thing figured out either. God's still working in it. Um, there's still things to teach me. I think until I die, God's got things to teach me. But I want to pray this over you. You can bow your head or you can keep your eyes open. I'm just going to read it. It's a prayer I wrote ahead of time. Lord, I thank you for the gift of time, for placing us perfectly within the time frame you have planned. Lord, help us to work within this time and to find ways to see the beauty within it. Father, we ask you to help us see the blessings in all seasons, to know that you are at work, even in our hardships, that you go before us, protecting and providing for us. Help us know that you walk with us in the center of all things both those that are easy and those that are difficult, and that you will be standing with us in them and on the other side of them. Father, help us to see you first, to focus on your faithfulness rather than the problem or even the blessing, and know that you provide for us in both. It is in your precious holy name I pray.